What up, my fucks? It's your boy, the hater of Pivot's Peace. And it's been a few days since I did a video, so I'm sure some of you are thinking, oh man, this hater gone again? Nah, motherfucks. The hater is back and back for good. And I've been wanting to do this for a while now, so we're going to start a new thing on the hater channel. I call it Review Rewind, motherfucks. <laughs> is it? And that's a, a thing that we're going to do once in a while where we're going to review old pay per views, right? We're going to do them in chronological order based on the haters' first ever WWE pay-per-view that I watched in its entirety. Now, for those of you that don't know, this one would be Royal Rumble 2000, I believe, was the first pay-per-view that I ordered, that I had my mother order for me when I was a wee little boy. But before this, I would rent the occasional DVD, or more likely VHS tape back in the day, from Blockbuster to watch old wrestling, right? But that, I didn't even know what the order was, you know what I mean? I didn't know, like, what came first, what came second. When I really started watching wrestling was around, like, SummerSlam of that year. So, like, around August of that year. And it took, like, several months for me to convince my mom to spend, like, 30 bucks so I could watch this because she didn't realize it'd be a lifelong thing. And it's been uh, pretty much wrestling since then cuts. Now, of course, back in the day, I didn't order every pay-per-view because... I couldn't convince my mom to do that, you know what I'm saying? Because she thought, she thought and still thinks wrestling was dumb. But let's get to it. Today, as a result, we're going to be reviewing one of my favorite pay-per-views. I'm a little biased because it's my first one. Royal Rumble 2000, which took place in Madison Square Garden, January 23rd, 2000. Now, I watch this again because it's one of my favorite pay-per-views. But to be honest, I didn't even need to watch it because that's how great this pay-per-view is. It's very memorable and it's just very well put together. So... First up, the, 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 the opening match is good old Taz. Taz's debut against an undefeated Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle comes out and cuts a promo. Basically saying that New York City sucks, right? Everybody knows Taz is going to debut. You have all these signs, right? That say Taz and like 13 and all these other things, right? But the hater didn't know who the hell Taz was, right? I'm like, who the hell is Taz? And why do these people have these signs that say 13 and have orange on them? Taz comes out. And I remember thinking back then, I'm like, wait a second, this guy's like a tiny dude, you know? I could tell that he was being presented as a big deal, and he was like obviously a hometown favorite of some, of some sort, but it is what it is. I never really bought, bought into Taz when I was a kid, right? That's the beauty of these review rewinds, right? I'm going to hit you with the frame of mind that I was at when I was watching this. So Taz comes out, and he pretty much beats Kurt Angle really quickly. The only thing that mattered here was that he puts the Taz mission on him, and Kurt Angle, after the match, after he passes out, or taps out, I don't remember to be honest, uh, even though I just watched it like a few hours ago, because I knew how the match ended, so I was kind of on my phone. But basically, afterwards, Kurt Angle is saying that, um, I think he passed out. Anyways, Kurt Angle saying how like, well, he didn't like, you know, he wasn't submitted because the choke is illegal, right? So Kurt Angle, like the storyline that became Kurt Angle trying to reestablish his undefeated streak, right? Which he successfully did. Due to his friendship with Stephanie McMahon, right? It was pretty cool. Um, a good way to debut someone and a good way to have Kurt Angle uh, have his streak end, right? To put someone over. Maybe they had big plans for Taz. or And maybe, more likely, honestly, they didn't realize how great Kurt Angle was going to be. Because if they did, obviously, they would just have Kurt Angle just put the ankle lock on him and just destroy him, right? The whole point of the match was Taz was suplexing Kurt Angle left and right. But it's like, if you knew that Kurt Angle was who he was, which everyone did know then like you would know that he would destroy Taz in about five seconds if you wanted to. But it is what it is. Back then, Olympic wrestling, amateur wrestling, just wasn't considered a good form of combat. It wasn't considered real, basically. You know what I'm saying? Nobody thought like, oh, wrestlers can kick ass because it was the era of Mike Tyson still. But anyways, it is what it is. Next up, we have the perfect tag match. The Hardy Boys versus the Dudley Boys in a um, tag team tables match. The first ever Tag Team Tables match of all time, motherfucks. The rules were as follows. Both members must go through tables, right? You have to put someone through the table. And when someone gets put through a table, they are eliminated essentially, but they can still hang out and interfere because it's a no DQ match. In other words, the match was booked to perfection, right? The match itself lasted somewhere around 10 minutes. It was a short match, but that's all you needed. It was a perfect match, in my opinion. One of the best tag team matches of all time. And my favorite match on the card. I was a big Hardy Boys fan back when I was a kid. And it was really great to see them on pay-per-view. And to see them win. The match, even though it was about 10 minutes, I remember as a child, it felt, it felt like it was an epic match. Because it was, right? 
The match goes as follows. Cax, basically the Dudley boys come out. They, first of all, they cut a promo. So even though the match was 10 minutes, the segment may have been like 15, 20 minutes, right? Because there was like a promo backstage. There was a victory. And then there was a great promo by the Dudleys. Basically, the Dudleys come out and they shit on New York City. It was great, right? They pretty much uh, talk about how New York sucks and how they should have picked a different mayor, etc., etc. It was just great. They were just getting booed. It was amazing, right? Then the match starts. And the match goes as follows. Cucks. Uh, I believe the first person put through a table is Jeff Hardy. I don't remember, to be honest. I wasn't even paying attention. Because there was a lot of spots where the Hardys are jumping through their own tables. But it doesn't really matter. The point is, in the end, there was only uh, Jeff Hardy and Devon were the ones that were left uh, in terms of like needing to be eliminated. right? Or maybe it was Matt. I don't even know. It must have been Jeff. right? But basically, Jeff and Bubba Ray climbed to the rafters. While uh, Matt and Devon are wrestling like below the rafters, right? Matt beats up Devon, gets the best of him, puts him on top of the table. Meanwhile, Jeff Hardy uh, hits Bubba Ray with a bunch of chair shots to the head. Bubba Ray falls from the rafters and crashes onto like four tables, right? There's one table left over. Matt puts Devon there. Jeff Hardy does a swanton from the rafters and they win. The match had great spots. It had great storytelling. And it was really instrumental in pushing both tag teams forward. 10 out of 10. 10 star match, this one on the haters scale. The Taz and Kurt Angle one, I give it a 2 st- two out of 10 stars. It wasn't good. Then we had the co-intercontinental champions, Chris Jericho and China versus Hardcore Holly and each other. It's triple threat, one of the fucks, to determine the undisputed intercontinental champion. Now, the match was whatever. This was a rare moment of Hardcore Holly having some exposure, so I, I, I really like that. Before the match, China and Jericho are arguing, and China's like, why don't you act like a gentleman once in a while? And Jericho's like, what is this, medieval times? You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm not going to be all chivalrous, right? The match starts, matches whatever. The whole storyline was that because China and Jericho were co-intercontinental champions, right? You know what I'm saying? Uh, Hardcore Holly was just beating each one of them in like singles competition. And that's how he earned his title shot. Because they, were, they would like fight each other. So Hardcore Holly would hit him with a falcon arrow and win, right? Long story short, what happened in the match was there was a point where China had Hardcore Holly in the walls of Jericho. Jericho runs up behind her, hits her with the bulldog, hits her with the lion salt, and wins. The crowd goes nuts. This was the beginning of Jericho's face turn. Arguably, it was his face turn, because up until this point, he was a heel. He was wrestling China, and people liked China. But now Jericho kind of overtook her in terms of popularity, so that was a good moment. It's a great moment of Jericho actually getting over in WWE. Then we had a short but fun match. The New Age Outlaws, Billy Gunn and Road Dog versus the APA. The whole point of the story was this. The APA are the superior tag team. They're stronger and tougher than the New Age Outlaws. But it doesn't matter because the New Age Outlaws are part of, part of DX. And DX cheats in all their matches. The match ends when x comes in. Hits like a wheel kick. And long story short, uh, the New Age Outlaws win. Uh, Bradshaw and, and, and Farouk had some moments, but it wasn't really anything special. Then we had one of the greatest title matches of all time. The Raw, I mean, sorry, Cactus Jack versus Triple H in essentially what was a hardcore match, but they called it a street fight. This was brutal, right? One of the best matches of all time. If you haven't seen this pay-per-view, watch it for this match, right? This was the first pay-per-view title match I've ever seen, and it really made me appreciate Triple H. I didn't really care about Mankind, and this match was not really that important in the greater context of the pay-per-view because the whole point was the Royal Rumble match, which we'll get to later, cuckolds. Then, what happened, cuts, is very, very simple, right? The match, just brutal, right? I, I didn't know who Cactus Jack was, so when, so when uh, Mick Foley said that he's going to bring out Cactus Jack, I'm like, what? That's just sounds, sounds kind of stupid. It's just him without a mask. Like, what, what's so great about Cactus Jack? But whatever, it is what it is. Um... The match was brutal, and Triple H just beat the hell out of Mick Foley, hit him with chairs, handcuffed him at one point, whooped his ass, The Rock comes out, hits Triple H with a chair. Uh, this allows Mick Foley to get uncuffed, even though he fought back without any arms for a while. Then he goes off on Triple H, whoops his ass. Thumbtacks are involved. Triple H hits the pedigree. Mick Foley kicks out of the pedigree. The first person ever to kick out of the pedigree, motherfucks. This was a huge deal back then. Then Triple H, I'm like, oh my god, he kicked out the pedigree, it's over. Like, Mick Foley's gonna win, right? Because I was still a kid that thought that good guys always won, motherfucks. And what I thought was this, well, he hit him with the, with the pedigree, nobody kicks out of the pedigree. Triple H picks him up, hits another pedigree on the thumbtacks. So I'm like, well, he just kicked out of one, why would he kick out of another one? 
And the answer was, because this one was the second one, and it was on thumbtacks. Triple H wins, everyone's bloody, it's brutal. Great match, 10 out of 10. One of the best matches ever, and hot take, motherfucks, in my personal opinion, the best Triple H, Triple H match of all time. Second, maybe only, to his uh, WrestleMania match with Taker. This is one of the, and also the, the match between him and Stone Cold, the three stages of hell. Those are all, both good. But this one is definitely up there. It might be the best one. Then we have the Royal Rumble. Now, I'm going to go through the Royal Rumble in some detail because as I watched it again, it's important to note how much storytelling there was in this Rumble. So first up, we have D'Lo Brown coming out, followed by Grandmaster Sexe. Rest in peace, Grandmaster Sexe. They basically do bullshit. They just wrestle there for a while. Uh, Headbanger Mosh comes out, and then Christian comes out. You know what I'm saying? So far, nothing great. People are just wrestling. They're just waiting, right? At number five, Big Kish, Rakishi comes out, right? Rakishi basically eliminates all four of the jobbers that I just mentioned, including Christian, who at the time was a jobber. D'Lo Brown, who just a few years before was in the final four of the Royal Rumble. Doesn't matter. Rakishi eliminates both of them, as well as Scotty Tuhani, who comes out next, right? Basically, he eliminates all the other ones, and it's just him, Grandmaster Sexay, and Scotty Tuhani, right? And they're about to do their dance, but Rikishi throws them both out. But Grandmaster Sexay and Scotty Tuhani, they kind of understand, right? They're like, all right, we get it. It's your moment, Rikishi. So thus far, Rikishi has eliminated like four people. Steve Blackman comes out. He gets eliminated by Rikishi. That's what? Like six people? Then Viscera comes out. He gets eliminated by Rikishi. Jerry the King Lawler is saying, whoever wins this match is going to be his favorite. Jerry the King Lawler is the best announcer of all time. And this match really shows it, right? He puts everybody over. You know what I mean? He's like, oh, Viscera. Everybody knew Viscera had no chance to win. But he's like, whoever wins this is going to win. Everybody knew Rikishi had, had no chance to win either. Then Big Boss Man comes out, right? Big Boss Man was not on the level of these other jobbers at the time. Big Boss Man was kind of like a big deal still. So he comes out. He doesn't get in the ring. He just stays out of the ring. Until Test comes out at number 10. And then he's the one that throws Big Boss Man in the ring. The British Bulldog comes in. Nobody really gives a flying fuck. But at, the, at this point, he was basically a mid-carder who wanted to be WWE champion. So it was like... All right, this could be a big deal, right? But it wasn't. Then Gangrel comes out. Believe it or not, Gangrel lasts quite some time, motherfucks. Uh, Edge comes out. He has some, some good moments here. Then Bob Backlund comes out, which is basically like a joke. Uh, he gets eliminated quite quickly by the next guy who comes in called Chris Jericho. Crash Holly comes out. And in this moment, as Crash Holly's there, Crash Holly is just an entertaining guy. Everyone likes him. So he stays a long time. But China comes out. Now you're thinking to yourself, who gives a fuck about China? But China comes out and eliminates Chris Jericho, right? To further the feud. So thus far, we already have two storylines going, right? We have China and Jericho being developed more in the Royal Rumble. She comes out and eliminates the new Intercontinental Champion. Then we have Rikishi, Big Kish, motherfucks. Big Kish is out there. And he, uh, you know, obviously is someone that's being taken seriously. So there you have it. He's someone that, you know is getting a push, basically, from this Royal Rumble, you know, which was really fun. Then, uh, Farouk comes out, uh, Big Boss Man eliminates him and China, or something like that. Uh, wait, is that what happened? Yeah, yeah, Big Boss Man eliminates them both. Then Road Dog comes out, and he gets eliminated by none other than Billy Gunn, mother fucks. This was not the beginning of the end, but it would have been, I think. Just Billy Gunn got injured uh, a month later, and he was kicked out of DX. But Billy Gunn eliminates Road Dog. Al Snow comes out. Um, he stays for a long time too. At this point, Al Snow was in this weird situation where people were like kind of contemplating giving him a push. It was really strange. Val Venus kind of on the same boat. He comes out. Prince Albert, also known as uh, A-Train, comes out. Harko Holly comes out. He actually has a redemption arc here. He stays for like 10 minutes in the match um, and gets eliminated eventually, but who gives a flying fuck? Then... We have The Rock, the people's champ comes out, motherfucks. The people's champ comes out at the coveted number 24 spot. He's out there laying the smack of down on all their candy asses until Billy Gunn comes out. He, Like I said, he eliminated uh, uh, Road Dog eventually. Billy Gunn was one of the final four people. And he was also, I believe, that Billy Gunn was due for a push if he didn't get injured. Because some people were actually saying, I think Billy Gunn's going to win the Rumble. He was like everyone's dark horse. Obviously, everyone knew he wasn't going to. Is he going to be The Rock or Big Show? Speaking of Big Show, he comes out at 26, motherfucks. Just throwing people left out, out, left and right. Bradshaw comes out. But guess what happens? Bradshaw's out there being a jobber. X-Pac comes in, right? Distracts people. 
Uh, Kane comes out too. X-Pac comes in, hits Kane with a fucking, uh, what's it called? Uh, spin kick, right? Uh, Kane throws X-Pac out actually. But guess what? Nobody sees that shit. So as Kane is being distracted by the New Age Outlaws, X-Pac throws him out. Uh, eventually, uh, the Godfather comes out and he gets thrown out as well. X-Pac is number 30. He earned that, that right. So in the end, we have Big Show, Kane, uh, X-Pac, and The Rock. At, in the end, we have X-Pac, The Rock, uh, and uh, Big Show, I believe. Eventually, we have Big Show and The Rock. And then what happens is fucking phenomenal. One of the greatest moments of the haters' childhood. The Big Show is destroying The Rock. So you're like, fuck, oh my God. And The Rock's going to get eliminated because you're a new wrestling fan. And you don't know. He gets The Rock up in the Oklahoma Stampede as he runs towards the rope. There are the ropes. The Rock grabs the top rope. They both flip over. The Rock's feet hit the ground first, but nobody notices. The Rock comes up. The Rock is the champ, mother fucks. If you smell what The Rock is cooking. This was a great pay-per-view. And honestly, I really enjoyed it. And I hope everyone enjoyed this rewind review, mother fucks. Because... We're going to do more of these, I think. You know, it depends on how this one goes, I guess. But we'll see, motherfuckers. With that being said, take care of yourselves and go fuck your mothers.